Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pratik. Congratulations to all the winners. And in my vocabulary, there are no losers. They are not winners. There is a couplet ki faisla hone se pehle main bhala kyun haar manu jag abhi jeeta nahi hai main abhi hara nahi hu. Why should I accept defeat or why should I be defeated when life is going on and time is always moving and every moment is eternity itself? The final decision is not yet out. So, faisla hone se pehle main bhala kyun haar manu jag abhi jeeta nahi hai main abhi hara nahi hu. Ladies and gentlemen, accelerating performance. The next session, as Pratik mentioned, is going to be about sports. Then you talk about sports. In sports, you don't get time to learn. Of course, you're learning on the job when you are practicing, but the learning is a hard way. You cannot hit the pitch on day one and say, I'm still learning or I'm learning and my learning start. You have to hit the pitch and perform. So it's day one performance. And then you have to keep accelerating the performance. The ability of organizations to, to reduce that, what we would call IPRGFTE, independently productive revenue generating FTE. If it's a two month time, how can that be crunched into one month or figure out ways where we can get first day ready employee a colleague who can perform and accelerate performance from day one ladies and gentlemen with brett lee i request you to prepare your questions it'll be a fantastic opportunity to ask questions and interact uh, questions like how can cricket and how can sports be related to our daily lives and our daily work life see as earlier leaders and distinguished leaders have mentioned that uh, you know, our work and home boundaries have gone away. Our office is at home now and we are working all the time. While we are working all the time, how can sports help us? Sports has been a fantastic part of everybody's life. Uh, so that will be one very interesting thing if you ask your questions. Second, it will be very interesting to learn from him. When you play, I'm sure you've seen the movie Karate Kid where Jackie Chan tells his little kid, uh, uh, jack it up, jack it down. He tells him to put the jacket up on the hook and then take it off and throw it, pick it up, take it off and put it again. And the kid gives up saying, what am I doing? I'm not learning karate. But when Jackie Chan actually explains, he says karate is or Kung Fu is in, in every part of your life. Learning is in every part of our life. Every part of our life prepares you for a sport. Our sport is the digital platforms, is the digital world. Questions like that would be very, very interesting. And if Brett, and Anuj, uh, uh, permit, you can get some extra time with them. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce Anuj and Brett Lee. Please welcome Anuj and Brett Lee. Hey, guys. Uh... Good afternoon, good evening, where you are. Uh, Brett, I know it's late evening for you. Uh, so good evening to you. Uh, no, uh, good, good to see you here. Um, I think, look, uh, the, the topic of the session today is accelerate your game, right? And what we have brought to you here is one of the fiercest competitors and fastest bowlers in the world. Um, it is only apt that we bring Brett uh, for throwing light on a topic like Accelerate Your Game, right? Uh, Brett was born in 1976. Uh, he was 16 years old when he started playing first grade cricket in Campbelltown, right? And then from there on, he was called to uh, represent Australia under the under-17, under-19 teams. Um, and interestingly, he made his international debut against India. Uh, this was in December 99 when uh, India was visiting Australia. Uh, in the tour of uh, you know uh, Australia, and this he was about 23 years in age, and since then uh, he's been on the world stage. I think 21 years now, but of course, significant amount of uh, you know game played up to the point when he retired in 2015. Um, he's done 276 Test matches, um, 221 ODIs, and when I say 221 ODIs, he took 380 wickets in that. Uh, this is the highest that any Australian has taken ever. 
in ODIs. I think that equals Glenn's uh, record as well. But uh, amazing amount of uh, cricket behind him, and uh, amazing tremendous achievements, right? And then who can forget T20, especially IPL? I think six years in IPL. Most of you will remember, you know, Kings Eleven Punjab, and about three years when Brett spent there, and then of course. Uh, the three years he spent with KKR, right? Uh, an amazing history in cricket, uh, a fierce competitor. Um, you know, considered one of the fastest bowlers in the world ever, right? Uh, his faster del fastest delivery touched about 161.1 kmph. I can't imagine facing something like that. And most batsmen were not comfortable with it, right? Uh, if you take the top six fastest bowlers around the world, right? Uh, the top five are actually Australians, um, you know. Uh, Sean Tate, Chef Thompson, uh, Mitchell Stark, Andy Roberts, and the fastest of them all, Brett Lee, right? Um, I, I remember times when the players, you'd be worried about facing him with the new ball because those outswingers were just absolutely unplayable. Uh, but they were worried when he came back again later with the older ball, right? Where he had amazing reverses, which would either break your toe or your wicket. And then who can forget the famous chainsaw celebration that we all saw on, on television. You can go to YouTube, you can still find it. Right. And then, of course, he's not just known for bowling. He's also known for his defined batting. Right. Um, Brett has bowled with some of the, um, the greats of Australian cricket. Glenn McGrath, Shane Vaughan, Andrew Simmons, Nathan Bracken, uh, Jason Gillespie. I think some of the fastest bowlers, uh, and he's bowled with all of them and bettered their records, basically. Uh, besides the uh, record that he's had with Australia, with Cricket Australia, he's also bowled and as he's also coached uh, Ireland and, and Sri Lanka. And then there are many awards he collected along the way. I mean, 2000, the Bradman Young Cricketer of the Year Award, uh, the Wisden Young Cricketer of, Year, um, Cricketer of the Year Award, the Wisden Cricketer of the Year Award, uh, Australian Test Player of the Year Award, and many, many more series awards. Man of the Matches Awards, uh, multiple five wicket hauls. I mean, you just can, I can just keep going on and on. And I think I wouldn't do justice to his achievements, right? Mm -hmm. Let me try and go to a different facet of, uh, uh, of Red, right? Um, for those of you who don't know, and you should, you should go to YouTube and check it out. He actually has a song with Asha Bhonsle. Uh, the song is You Are The One For Me. Um, and this was recorded when Australia was visiting India for the 2006 ICC Championships trophy. They actually went to win the trophy as well. But somewhere along the way, in the middle of those matches, uh, you know, Brett stole away, uh, wrote the lyrics of the song, and recorded the song with Asha. It was uh, amongst the top two songs in our charts in that year. Uh, he also plays in a band, Six and Out. It's, uh, it's a band that he has with his brother Shane, who used to also you know, play for Australia, and some of his New South Wales teammates. He plays the... Uh, the bass guitar as well as the acoustic guitar and sings in English and, by the way, Hindi as well. Well, if you think that wasn't enough, uh, he also has a movie to his name. Actually, two, right? If I take one as there was this movie called Victory, and you can find this on YouTube, Victory and Bretley. Um, you'll find a role that he plays there. But then, of course, a kind of a longish, a full role in a, in a, in a movie called Unindian. Um, this was a 2016 Australian romantic comedy. Uh, it was filmed by, uh, it was directed by Anupama Sharma. And then, of course, he worked with uh, uh, Tanishita Chatterjee from uh, in that movie. So the, you should actually go back. The whole thing was shot in Sydney. And it's an amazing thing to go back. Now, what does Brett do today? Um, he is currently commentating for Fox Sports in Australia uh, and for Star Sports throughout India. You will see him in most of the key matches. Um, he also supports a number of charities, uh, the Salvation Army, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, and the Make of His Foundation. He actually also has a foundation that he set up in India. It's called Music, set up in 2007. Um, it looks at music as a powerful tool to heal, empower, educate, and advocate uh, marginal marginalized children in India. Um, it's got six centers around India. Uh, the charity also provides music therapy to children suffering from cancer. So it's amazing run, right? He's also a global hearing ambassador or cochlear, uh, kind of an implant hearing solution. So that's your versatile Mr. Brett Lee. And Brett, welcome once more. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I present Brett Lee to you. I know, thank, thank you very much. Very much. That's, that's probably, that's probably the best I've ever had in my life. So thank you, it's very kind. 
Thanks, Brett. And I will just, you know, Brett, I'll just connect you back to what we're doing here and the audience. Um, we have an audience uh, in the audience leaders from uh, some of the biggest organizations in the country. Uh, these organizations recruit thousands of young professionals. And one challenge they face is um, an ability to get the best out of um, the teams that they that they bring in, that they have, right? Uh, getting the best and accelerating performance requires introduction of new capabilities, you know, introducing a you know culture of innovation, uh, giving them problem-solving skills, uh, critical thinking. All of that, when you try and do at scale, uh, that necessitates transformative learning. Uh, that's the theme of the entire conference, right? Uh, according to uh, Jack Maziro, who actually you know built that theory in 1978, uh, an important aspect of transformative learning is an individual's ability to continuously change their frames of reference as they get new information. Uh, to be able to critically reflect on what they know, what they've experienced, and bring in new thinking and change the way they are defining their worlds as they go forward. Now, you came into the uh, Australian cricket team as a promising prospect at a very, very young age. And you've seen uh, both the game evolve. You've seen the game evolve from the test to the T20, you know, uh, T50s to the T20s and the IPLs of the world. And you've also seen the changes in transformation um, as things have evolved over the years that you know Cricket Australia did or the Board of Control of Cricket in India did, right? Um, so I think uh, what the audience would love to hear from you is your experience about the transformative learning that you have seen uh, in the world of cricket. Uh, some initial thoughts uh, before I go into a question answer mode uh, with you, Brett. Yeah, look, I think um, and the most important thing about sports person is that you have to be able to evolve. You have to be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, am I doing the right thing? Am I going down the right path? Am I going to go down a road less travelled? They were all the questions that we asked ourselves when we started uh, our campaign in early 2000. You know, we wanted to be the best. At that stage there, we'd, we'd won, I think it was close to about 14 test matches straight. I think the record was 16. And we just committed totally to each other. We committed totally to Australia. We committed totally to our team that we wanted to train like we were number three in the world. And even though that we were currently ranked number one, we train like we're number three. And the reason why I say that is because if you train like you're number one and you assume you're number one and, you know, you become complacent, uh, you might take little um, detours that are easier, easier options than rather than doing the hard work. But if we thought, okay, well, we're, we, you know, we aren't number one in this particular field in test match cricket, so we have to train harder than any other team. You know, we made sure that we wasn't necessarily training longer, just training smarter. So we had a, a wonderful uh, tech team around us. We had some great insights, some great statisticians that believe they could actually change the way the game's moving. Because you think back then, it was purely we had a coach, we had a manager, and that was pretty much it. Maybe a physiotherapist, maybe a, you know the occasional doctor that would be on the ground or you know needed. You know we never had a, a statistician, analysis person. Uh, you know we never had um, anyone from a uh, psychology background. We never had anyone from a uh, sports and nutrition uh, fitness background. So I guess what I'm saying is that we wanted to completely override the whole system, train smarter, train shorter, but make sure we were going down a different road. If we keep doing the same things over and over again, our competition was slowly going to catch up. And when that competition catches up and then they use your techniques and then they get to your level, it's very hard to play catch up. Interesting, Red. Uh I will go through the rest of the session through a set of questions, right? And the way I'm structuring these questions is I'm going to go through the life cycle of a, of a cricketer as he gets into cricket to the time he retires, right? Um, and I, I'll, I'll walk through that. It's very similar to Akin to us, you know, hiring people into our organization and how do we try and take them yeah. through the journey that they spend with their mission. So I think the first first set of questions is about, uh, you know, player selection and induction, just like we would do a... Uh, employee yeah. selection and induction, right? Uh, what are selectors looking for when they pick champions like you? Can you recount your experience 
when cricket australia picked you well look i it's it's hard to pick a champion because you haven't become a champion yet so they they're picking a thing which is a very very a word that i don't like using a lot but potential this guy's got potential this girl's got potential this this young kid has got potential now it's a dangerous word because potential could mean they've got that much talent but if they don't fulfill the talent through hard work dedication sacrifices you know making sure they dedicate their life to what they want to do then that potential can go down the drain i think what they're looking for is a person that is totally committed to their job and you know i've got two older brothers an older brother shane who also played for australia played for new south wales first a genuine all-rounder you know number 4 batsman that could bowl fast uh, a younger brother grant who also played uh, state cricket at a junior level um you know once again a fast bowler and a number 4 batsman and i was probably the person in the family with the least amount of cricket talent but what i had was that that never say die attitude i had that total commitment to whatever ha- talent that i had i get the most out of my talents and not saying that my brothers didn't but i think i was more hungry you know i i i wanted to succeed to me it wasn't about fame or fortune or having my name up in lights or winning an award or getting a trophy i played the game because i loved it and i i always tell the story and it was that um you know i would have played for free i would never tell cricket australia that now i'll probably tell them now because it's it's too late but i would have played this wonderful game called cricket for free because i loved it i was so passionate about it um it became my my you know my whole life but all that said and done so i had other interests which we'll get into like later which i think um i think that really helped my cricket having other interests but what a selector looks for is a person that's hungry a person that is willing to back themselves and also a person that is also a little bit i wouldn't say vulnerable but a person that that can can you know like a rough diamond that needs some that polishing because if you if you look for the perfect employee it's not going to happen if you look for the perfect cricketer it's not going to happen but you want to find glimpses and take that rough diamond and polish it up to be that perfect stone i think interesting karol ri i think uh, right um, and has parallels to what we have to do in our corporate world but let me ask you the flip side right you were the rough diamond that was brought into the organization uh, how were you inducted into the culture into the organization what was the atmosphere like in the uh in the dressing room as you were brought in as a youngster uh how how did the team initiate you or the rituals what is expected from you at that stage uh of of the game basically yeah look i think you know when you join a team and and you know for me i can't speak on behalf of any other national side but i can only speak on behalf of what i went through but the australian cricket team for me you know i i'd met a lot of the local new south wales players like steve and mark war Michael Bevan um yeah Michael Slater my brother Shane playing one day cricket so I I'd met quite a few of those guys McGrath McGill I mean we had a pretty strong New South Wales side but all that said and done when you when you then make the team or make the squad you have to learn and you have to sort of fend for yourself which is I think very important if you you know you see kids in india you see kids in australia and their parents would just give them absolutely everything you know you always see the kid who turn up with all the best gear and he's been spoon fed his whole life or her whole life and they'll become a, an okay cricketer but they won't become that top cricketer because they haven't got the hunger and they expect everything to happen for him and i think it's a really important message to you have to learn how to do something for yourself. I ask a lot of questions because if I don't know the answer, I'll ask questions and that's the best way to learn. But you should only have to ask that question once. If you if you're taught something, then you should be able to repeat that day in day out. If you don't know the answer and like I was at school or like I was in the Australian cricket team, if I don't know the answer, 
I'd ask, I'd ask the question to find the answer to make me a better player. So sometimes people also are too embarrassed to ask that that tough question. So when I joined the team, it, it was like, um, you know, you, you had to fend for yourself. You had to learn for yourself what you were doing. Um, you had to create your own little niche. And and most importantly, the the quickest and the best thing that I learned was to don't try to replicate or be someone else. You've got to be true to yourself. So as, you know, if you're an employer and you see me coming into a new job or a new opportunity, I'm not going to be trying to be that next person and emulate or try to mimic what they're doing. I'm trying to be my own person. I want to stand out. I want to do something different. And that's the thing. If you do something well and do it different without being too flamboyant, then you'll do pretty well. Interesting, Glenn. Uh, let me ask you a totally disconnected question, right? Um, just to hear your comments on it. In the latest test match that's going on, Tim Payne had a fairly painful uh, test match, right? Uh, sledging with Ashwin. And then you also had uh, Steve Smith scuffing out what was called a Rishabh Pant's, you know, guard. Any comments? What do you think went right or wrong in that match? And what do you think will happen in Gaba? Look, it's a it's a tough one because I know I know what Stephen Smith's like. He's a he's a wonderful person. Um, you know, I, I was I was the same. I was watching that game, and I, I you know I saw what happened. Uh, the thing I can say, uh, and obviously being a you know a former teammate. He does it all the time, Stephen Smith. He, he he's constantly marking center. He's constantly trying to find out where the batsman is going to play his shots. I don't think there was anything untoward with that at all. Uh, and I know that um, you know most of the Indian cricket team would not probably think that as well. But come you know come the Gabba, it's going to be an, you know an amazing game up the Gabba. There's going to be a lot of uh, passion that's going to come out against uh, Australia. A lot of passion against India. But what I can say is that the two teams got on very, very well, and that's so important. Any predictions on who you think will win? Well, I think Australia have to go in as favourites at the Gabba because of the bowling attack. And what I mean by the, the bowling attack, it's the bowling attack that's still standing. You know, India, unfortunately, have lost a lot of uh, players. They've lost a lot of their, their bowling stocks. You know, you think back to Mohamed Shami, who would have been lethal at the Gabba. Um, you know, you're looking at other players as well that have, that have got injured, that have, um, you know, got uh, strained or broken bones. So I think because the Australian fast bowling unit's quite quite uh, strong and also they're, they're, they're very fit and playing up at the Gabba, that's the reason why I think that Australia will have the benefit. Thanks. Um, thanks for being honest on that answer. Uh, I will go back on track on what we were going through, right? We talked about the induction of uh, champions into a team. We talked about how they settle down. Uh, I'm not going to go to you know another facet of it, right? Where employees, as they come in, they try and apply what they know, right, uh, onto a on, onto a game situation. Uh, now, one of the challenges we have in the corporate world is uh, we train a lot of people. Uh, we bring them in with enough learning as well, and people forget what they have learned when they are faced with real life problems in the workplace, right? Um, they default to normal behavior. So I know that from a cricket standpoint, when you go to uh, play in the game, uh, you study the opposing team. I'll be interested to know how as well, but you, you study the opposing team uh, in great de detail before you land up on the pitch. How do you remember on the field the strengths and weaknesses of each of the opposing team members uh, and use it to your advantage? How do you really prepare for this? I would love to know that. Well, to me, it's purely about training the way that you want to play. So I would always train and prepare like I was playing a test match. And I'm, I know it's almost impossible to get that, repli that um, try to replicate that exact level and energy and atmosphere. It's almost impossible to do, right? But I had to try to bowl full pace in the nets. So what I would try and work on is if I did all the hard work in the nets, and the preparation and my hydration was great. My food intake was fantastic. I was stretching. I was making sure I was nice and loose before the game. I was ticking every little box. See, I, I think one percenters are the most important. If you do things well and there's little one percenters better than the other like team or opposition, 
you generally win more games. If you're in a business and you do the simple things better than the other person, the other guy or girl, generally you'll, you'll outperform them. So for me, it was my, making sure I had my research done, making sure I knew the opposition. Uh, if I was up against Sachin Tanduka, I would purely go back and have a look at all the times I bowled against Sachin and I would, I would walk into the game with the last memory of every single time I was lucky enough to dismiss Sachin Tanduka. If I was playing a test match and I was, I would have clips of me bowling in one day cricket, getting me out or T20 cricket or test match cricket. So that positive influence in my mind, that, 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 that right um, mental state to go into. So the hard work's done, the preparation to, to visualize about getting Sachin Tanduka out. And then just before I'd get off the bus, I'd watch a, you know, a video clip. It might be two wickets. It could be five or 10 wickets depending on how well I went against that opposition player, I would then walk onto the field with that really clear, almost like a film roll in my head. And I could visualise how I got them out, why I got them out, and then snap straight into it. Now, look, that, that didn't always happen. You know, I didn't always get the, the best player out. But I think if you prepare and you train your brain, you've got to be able to train your brain. You're constantly fighting the... The hardest opposition any person I believe will ever come up against is them, is me. So that little birdie on the shoulder that's talking, saying, you're not as good, you can't compete against Sachin Tanduka, um, Verna Sawak's going to hit you for six, um, Lakshman's going to hit you through mid-wicket, you're not bowling quick enough, it's too hot. All those negative thoughts you have to get rid of, and that's why I think that visualisation and understanding about how I got that person out before was really, really helpful. Interesting. Uh, very interesting. And, and what you seem to be saying is train, train, train. Keep it simple and apply basically. And it's, it's just going to be, and, and of course, believe in yourself, which is, which is an interesting way to look at it. Has, has parallels too in the corporate world as well. Um, so interesting. Um, now, just one other thing, right? Um, you know, when I'm talking of an employee in the organization, I'm talking of a cricketer in the, in the team. When the team goes to play, there are often times when you have to change your strategy midway through the match. Uh, perhaps there's an inning in the test match uh, at the midway point or maybe midway point on T20s or T50s. Um, it's very difficult to transform your game from what it is usually to what you have to do in a situation, right? Uh, how do players make this uh, uh, transform the game suddenly and how do players do this? Uh, any any thoughts, any ideas around there? Look, I think I think as a person, there, there's a lot of ego that happens with sport. And I think there's a lot of ego that happens with business too. And sometimes you'll find sports people and business people, they'll know they're not doing the right thing and they'll know what they're doing isn't quite right. It's not going to give them the best result at the end of the day. But because they're too stubborn, or they're too embarrassed to change something or admit that they're at fault or admit that what they're doing is not right, they stick to what they've been doing and they consistently do it and they try to tell themselves everything will be fine. If I keep doing this, uh, I'll, you know, I'll be okay. Now, you know deep down it's, you've got to trust that gut feel. That gut feel is so important, I've always said. So if you believe, and it's, been happened, it's happened plenty of times to me on the sporting field where I'll go in, and I'll have like what I call a plan A. So my plan A might be I'll bowl enough balls in the area, swing the ball away to um, Dravid or Sachin Tanduka, and then I might try the big Yorker. Now, if that doesn't work and I try it two or three times and, and they're consistently waiting for it, because they've, they've done their research on me too, and they know that that might be the ball that would potentially get them out the best. So then rather than doing the same thing over and over again, being predictable, you've got to be able to evolve. You know, you've got to have a plan B and a plan C. So don't just have plan, like a second plan, have a third plan, have a plan C in place. So if plan A doesn't work, you go to plan B. If plan B doesn't work and you normally frazzle and think, geez, I'm, I'm really struggling here, keep your composure, go to plan C. And then all of a sudden they think, geez, this, this guy's got so many different options to do or, or so many different ways to get a batsman out. 
but you've just trained with three different little things and you and you're going to be comfortable to fall back on those different variations so i think as i got older i i learned to um you know the, the fast bouncer even though when i finished bowling you know i wanted to bowl 150 k's for 20 years straight which i did and even in the last big bash game i played i hit 150 and that clicked off my 20 years of 150 k's or above but i knew that they were waiting for that short ball so then i had to evolve i had to work on a slow ball bouncer and off cut a slow ball bouncer to a right hander or an off cut a slow ball bouncer to a left hand and maybe when a right hand is in i might have to go a big leg cutter slow ball bouncer they hit against the spin so you've got to change you have to evolve and it's okay to do that um it's okay to be stubborn and i think stubborn is important in in life because you demand the best from you but there's a time where you've got to understand too that what you're doing is not right and you might have to change and change is sometimes good just uh any thoughts on players that you've seen change their game um dramatically i think uh, you know is a talent what is it that helps them but any examples of you know cricketers you feel either in the indian team or in the australian team who you believe evolved through the years and changed their game dramatically uh, because of the talent that they had the core talent that they had yeah look uh, i i think of you know a few players um straight away i think of uh back in the day the great dennis silly you know one of australia's greatest fast bowlers 355 test wickets I uh, heard his back so he had to come back as a different bowler. He was never as quick, but geez, he was accurate. He totally changed his action. He totally went to line length and worked on his shape, worked on his fitness. Um I think closer to the sort of modern day player Steve Waugh when he first went in, uh he would play all the hook shots, all the um the pull, you know, the pull strokes. Then realized that he may have got out a few times but it wasn't his his best shot so then he put that shot away and never played it and that takes a lot from when you've you've scored runs but you might you know he may have got out a few times so he's actually changed the way that he's thinking um i think of steven smith now you know the way that he um backs himself with his technique now if you look at steven smith normally uh as a batting coach you'd probably say his technique shouldn't work but it works for him and that's important for boys and girls too that they should try to have their own technique because imagine saying to Stephen Smith oh you better make sure you hit in the v otherwise you won't get any runs and you, you know you'd never play first grade cricket or first class cricket or you'll never play for australia well he's proven that everyone wrong uh jasper bumra with his action with his arm that goes out that way and he pushes a ball in people would normally say as a bowling coach you've got to get that arm up and snap it down which generally you do have to but it works for him and it works very very effective for him so i think a lot of players have actually evolved and they've and they've they've grown into their own uh technique they've grown into their own form and that's really important so you you like the whole message there is you have to be true to yourself but you have to believe in yourself be true to yourself addressing an interesting parallels again i think uh, from you know having uh, belief in yourself practice 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 apply it uh, keep it simple and of course you know evolve as 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 your as your game goes right i mean as your game as in as your age goes and i'll come back to that in a bit one more but let me go to a totally different set of questions right uh, just a few trick questions again again I'll, I'll name a few batsmen, and I want you uh, want to understand who do you rate uh, as a better batsman uh, uh, and why, right? So I will just you know name batsmen from different eras: um, Sachin Tendulkar, Steve Smith, Virat Kohli, and Virendra Sehwag. Again, Sachin, Steve Smith, Virat, Virendra Sehwag. Who do you rate better, or, or who would you not love to bowl to, basically? Well. to bowl to any of those four would be an absolute nightmare because they're four quality bowlers. You know, when you think about uh Sachin Tendulkar, Stephen Smith, Virat Kohli, Overend Sawag, 
they're, they're four unique, amazing players with a wonderful record. Uh, two players that are still playing currently that will go on to probably go down as uh, two of the greatest batsmen to ever play the game in all formats of the game. But when you think about Sachin Tanduka, firstly, his technique, I believe, was world-class. And the reason why his technique was world-class, he worked very hard on it, and he's a classic in the V player. So if I bowled off stump line to Sachin Tanduka, I knew he was going to like pump me down the ground for four. If I bowled off stump, he'd generally try to hit me past, past the bowler. He might take me past mid-off sometimes take me through cover. But I knew that, that that was sort of the line that he was going to hit me. So he'd play in the V. He's a traditional um, quality technique batsman. If I look at someone like a Stephen Smith, now I could bowl the off-stump line to Stephen Smith and he could hit me through mid-wicket because of his setup and because of his hands, because of the way he moves around the crease. doesn't mean it's better or worse. It's just that he's a different player. Um, if you look at Barat Kohli, I think he's a lot like technique with Sachin. So if you bowl that side stump, he hits you through backward point, cover sort of region, mid-off. If you bowl straight, he hit you down the ground. If you sort of lean into bowling the leg side, he hit you through mid-wicket. And that's, that's hard to bowl to sometimes too because he's so technically correct. I mean, when Kohli first came in, guys would try to nick him off because he'd have some loose hands going there, but he straightened up really quickly, and that's obviously when he became world-class. And, and, and then you look at someone like Saywag, you could bowl an off stump to Saywag, he'd let the ball go, just passed off stump. The next ball he could hit you down the ground for four, and the next one he could slice you for six over point. So unpredictable. Um, Viru is a type of batsman that, you know, he could hit you all parts of the ground, the same ball and that is sometimes the toughest batsman to bowl to because you can't set a field you can set a field to Sachin you can set a field to Coley it's hard to set a field to Stephen Smith I believe because of his technique and it's almost impossible to set a field to Viru because he's quite as likely to hit you have mid wicket or cow corner for six and then slice you over third man for six as well in a test match interesting Okay, I'll go on to another question, uh, again, uh, unrelated to uh, just the serious questions we have. Uh, just, you know, I'm going to go Indian actresses, right? Nothing connected to cricket for the moment. And I want your, you know, pick on this. I'll tell you four names. I, I hope you've met all of them. Aishwarya Rai, Deepika Padekon, Priyanka Chopra, Juhi Chavla, and Preeti Zinta. Who do you think is the best actress based on what you know? And I know you don't know too much, but still, you've met most of them, I guess. Look, I've met I've met a few of them. I've met I obviously know all of them, um, and they're and they're all wonderful as as we call now actors because you know people don't normally say actors and actresses, and you know they're all commonly in Australia known as actors now. Uh, Look, who, who's the best? It, it, it's like saying who's the best cricketer, like who's got the best action, who's got the best technique. It, it's it's hard to compare different eras too. Ashwai Rai, obviously she was the sort of one that burst on the scene first and then was pronounced, I think, Miss World uh, back in the day. Um, obviously a very, very attractive woman, or as they say in, in, in Hindi, a, a sundaletiki, as they say. Um, and then, you know, you, you think of... Um, you know, someone like a, a pretty Zinta. She, she's obviously the girl that I know the closest because of that association with Kings Eleven. Very, very down to earth, very, very knowledge, knowledgeable now of cricket, and she's upskilled herself as well. Um, so I, I, I probably know a lot more what she does because I've obviously spent three years, um, you know, working very closely with her when she, when she was obviously and still is, um, you know, one of the owners of, of Kingsland and Punjab. So, yeah, probably probably pretty Zinta, I think, only because I understand and I've seen a lot more of her, her movies and I know her personally as a person. Um, and, look, I, you know, I can't say how lovely she is because she's such a such a down-to-earth person. Thanks. Thanks for being honest. Now let's go back to the serious set of questions again, right? Uh, we talked about people coming into the organisation, uh, people then 
applying what they knew uh, onto onto the field right we'll go to another facet of this we'll go to mentoring and coaching right how does a coach learn to recognize the training needs of individual players right um we have members in our teams in the corporate world the strengths and weaknesses vary quite a bit so in your case for example i think john buchanan was the uh, the coach from 1999 to 2007 a significant portion of your cricketing life as well and when he was the coach uh, he was training the likes of glen glen mcgrath um uh, jason gillespie shane wan all at the same time all in different age groups all in different um styles and vintage right so how does a coach train a team which is as diverse as that and try to still get to an objective of a win like i think what what makes a good coach is a good listener uh a good man manager um and that 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 is a a word that I'll, obviously you, you know you can use as a as a female coach too you know a person that can actually manage personalities very very well the thing about john buchanan that he you know he didn't have to play a high level of cricket to be known as, as a good coach i think what john buchanan did very very well was he he actually tried to challenge a lot of the you know a lot of us as players but also to try try to get the best out of us and and to try to sort of push us to 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 different levels or different heights that we never thought that would reach uh it's very important i think for a coach to understand everyone's personality so um if i'm your coach anuj and i you know i know that um you know you seem like a very you know chilled out relaxed type of person i'm going on what we obviously spent some time here and previous women have spoken as well that I would treat you a certain way but there are other people that might be in an association that they they might be a lot more sensitive you know you have to treat them differently and they use this technique where you answer about 100 multiple choice questions and they have four quadrants and you'll be put in a certain quadrant and they had these uh names called a mozzie a feeler a thinker an enforcer and the mozzie was someone like me now I was a mozzie andrew signs was a mozzie and what a mozzie is or a mosquito as we call them mozzies over here as you can understand by the name a mozzie is a person buzzing around um they 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 just love life they're full of energy hard to hard to shut up always talking always making jokes and and they react very quickly to what's happening So a mozzie is a person that yes they do their preparation but it's all what happens instantly they can react very very quickly they can um understand the game because it's reactional now you've got a feeler might be a person um you know like a Michael Bevan that play with us and once again there's no right or wrong wrong answer for different quadrants it's just different personalities So a feeler might be uh you know a batsman where if a batsman gets out they could think about that shot for a whole week and they could inside be like hurting inside uh they could be struggling they could be um really embarrassed about that shot you know if they've bowled badly if it's a, a person that that's you know very close to their feelings so you have to treat them differently as well um you know you've got a thinker now a thinker might be someone like in our team might be like a mike hussey now mike hussey thinks about the game a lot he thinks about what he has to do he thinks about where the ball is going to bowl he thinks so you've got to treat him differently as well so when you say just do that he's not the mozzie he's not the type of guy that can just do something he has to think about it understand of 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 like plan everything strategically plan it out and then the enforcer might be a person like a Shane Warne who is um you know a leader someone like a Stephen Warr that's a born leader that can gravitate and people just gravitate like a like a magnet to him and they and they take the best out of that and they can they can lead a team and then you have a chameleon that sits in the middle that is like a little bit of both now i've 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 got a little bit of enforce a mozzie um and it's funny that they reckon too that when they've done the studies on this that 
when alcohol's mixed in with these personalities, they totally change. So a, a mozzie might become a feeler thinker, and a feeler thinker might then become a mozzie enforcer. But John Buchanan made us do all this test, and then he treated us differently. So the mozzies might need a bit more of a rev up, whereas the feeler thinker might might need a you know a bit of a cuddle and a bit of a hug and every, every, you know everything will be okay, mate, type of thing. Interesting. I've made a note of this. Mozzie, feeler, thinker, enforcer. I'm going to try and use it with my team for sure. Uh, a very, very interesting approach to this. Uh, but I, I, it, it gives a very good, interesting idea on you know how how you try and segment them and have a plan for them. Yeah. These and, and, and every, everyone's different. So that you know, the whole point about that chat was like you can't treat every work person, every colleague the same because everyone's different. Everyone's going through different parts of their life. Um, you know, there might be guys and girls that are coming to work that have got personal issues at home, you know, they might have, you know, they, they, they might be a marriage breakdown. It could happen in sport as well where they're struggling with their fiancé or their, their, their girlfriend, their boyfriend, whatever it might be. So you've got to understand that people are going through different parts and stages of their life as well. You've got older people, you've got younger people coming through. So you can't, I think if you're a coach or a boss, you can't treat everyone the same, otherwise you're not going to get the best out of anyone. Thanks, Glenn. A very interesting uh, thing. Um, just one other thing, right? Uh, when we, uh, when organizations want to align their teams, uh, very often we try and align them to a, a, a strategy or a vision that we have, right, for what the team needs to do. I think the same applies in cricket as well, right? So when you're trying to align a team, uh, especially if in a match you want to, uh, you know, get everybody aligned, there is the the the, the bowler. Uh, the wicket keeper, the captain, they are very, very closely involved in everything that's going on, right? But the remaining eight players who are also the fielders, how do you bring them all together into it? Because otherwise it becomes a bowler, a captain, and a, and a wicket keeper trying to figure out what needs to be done at what point in time in the game. How do you get everybody aligned? How do you get everybody's inputs in it, respect to whether they're a fielder or a bowler? Because that's very critical to bring the team together to try and get an end objective. How do you do that in cricket? Well, I think it's important. One thing we started doing was almost having KPIs. Uh, we, we would have KPIs. We would have targets that we wanted to hit. So even though that I might be the bowler, you've got Glenn McGrath, you've got Shane Warne, you've got Jason Gillespie, depending on the day, might be um, Andy Bickle. So we, we, you know, we know our role. Our, our, our roles are try to take wickets and bowl tight and, you know, just, just do that from one end. Gilchrist behind the stumps, or Brad Haddon, he knew that he had to take the catches. So if the Knicks came, for the catches. But what about the guy that's fielding at point? What about the guy that's at cover? What about the guy that's at mid-off that won't necessarily get a bowl? And your point's a very valid point, and it was because y y you've got to involve these people, otherwise they they can switch off. And if they switch off, they, they might make that crucial mistake, and that crucial mistake might be a catch in the covers late in the day that might cost the test match. A crucial mistake in a business might be, well, I didn't think it was my role. Um, someone else I thought would have done it, so I'm, I'm not going to take any responsibility. It's not on me. It wasn't my fault. Someone else should have done it. So we, we started creating game games within games. So we had competitions in a test match about how many runs that people could save. So mid-off we'll be having a competition with cover. Cover will be having competition with point, point with gully. Um, there'll be all these different competitions happening. And then, you know, you might go off at lunchtime and Andrew Simons might say, I'm three up, which means that he's saved three runs. So he's got three, three in the bank type of thing. So then every person feels part of the team. You might have uh, a person that's at mid-off for that particular day that his role is to sprint down and grab your hat and your sunglasses and then and give it straight to the umpire to speed the time up, to get through the overrate. And that that's a very important role because if you're behind the overrate, it reflects badly on us as a team. It reflects on the captain. The captain could miss a game. So that's a very important role. So everyone gets given a certain role. Um, changing 
around the different spots sometimes too is always nice. And, and, and just giving people that freedom to be able to uh, understand that they can try different things. But also to giving everyone a voice. Now, just because you're not bowling at cover and, you, you, you know, you might not be batting until we take another six or seven wickets, you can have a voice. So you can actually come up to the captain or come up to the vice captain or come up to the bowl and say, hey, what about if you went around the wicket and we put a guy behind square, might try some short stuff. So, uh, you know, allowing – and then me as a bowler or the captain go, no, nah, get away, you're just a batsman. That makes them feel – well, they're not part of the team. So we encourage everyone to be a leader, a bit of an enforcer. We encourage everyone to have a voice. At the end of the day, it was Steve War or Ricky Ponning that would make that final call. But everyone would have that opportunity to, to, to put their best foot forward. Now, if you've got 11 players on the field and you've got 11 uh, different voices, generally, you, you know, you know where there's – there'll be some wild comments thrown in, which you go, thanks, but not today. But generally, 80% of the time, everyone's thinking the same thing. And why not use everyone's experience rather than just one captain? Interesting. Now, I'm going to just paper this with a few questions that are coming from the audience. Um, Vijay Kumar Srinivasan has a question saying, some successful test players are not always successful in ODIs. Is this a skill issue or a mindset issue? Thanks very much. The, um, I was just reading through that. Look, I think it's 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 not necessarily a a mindset. You know, there might be different skills used in one day cricket to test cricket, and it's a good question. From, from Vijay Kumar because, you know, you might be much better suited at, at a particular game. Now, I know there are players around the world that are particularly suited at better games. I think personally, me, I think I was probably a better one-day bowler than a test match bowler because what suited me in the shorter format of the game was in test match cricket, a batsman can sit on me for five overs and what I mean, sit on me, I, I mean, they just sort of wait for me to get through my five overs. Don't play any risky shots because they've got time. In test match test match cricket, you have time. Now, one day cricket, there's, there's no time. They always have to play their shots. So that then brings me into the game. So I thought that I was probably suited better in one day cricket because batsmen had to take more risks than what they would have done in, in test match cricket. So, look, I think it's it's more of a... Um, look, it could be that 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 mindset, you know, that 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 mindset issue as well, because you you know you believe that you're better in one form of the game. But I think it comes down to the way the game's structured too. I think batsmen have to attack in one day cricket, so there are, are bowlers that would be better suited playing in you know one day cricket. Uh, just take one more of the audience questions now. Uh, can you think of an Indian player who could become a possible future coach for Australian cricket? That's a nice one. <laughs> Oh, look, there are there are plenty of Indian cricketers um, that could, you know, become, um, you know, current Australian coaches. You know, most probably most of the the current Indian crop have got good cricket brains. I, I, th I personally think someone like a, um, you know, Rohit Sharma with his ex experience, with his knowledge, if he wanted to do it, look, maybe, maybe he wouldn't want to do it either. But he 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 gets on well with the Aussies. He understands the game, doesn't get too uh, flamboyant when things don't go, you know, bad or, or, or worse for him or great for him. He's, he's a pretty level character. I think as a coach, you have to be a pretty level character. You can't be hot and cold the whole time or up and down or angry or sad or happy type of thing. You've got to be that con consistent character. So I think someone like, a, you know, like a Rohit Sharma, Ajinka Rahane seems like a lovely guy, and I know him personally, and he is a lovely guy. Got a great cricket brain too. So, yeah, that, that, those sort of two guys, I think, definitely, um, if, if they wanted to, of course. They'll probably want to help India first. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but let's, let's go on to our you know, remaining set of questions, which is along the thread we were taking, right? Um, 
I'd like to go on towards, uh, you know, maturing and evolving through your career. And we touched upon that briefly earlier as well, right? Uh, as the younger crop comes in, um, the senior players or the players that are there have to keep learning and changing the game, all right? Uh, more so to stay relevant. Um, also to think about saying, you know, when the lots of times when you, you try and make a comeback uh, because you are now competing with a crop, which is a very different age group, right? Um, how do people do that? And what is the role of an organization to help them, right? Saying that, look, you're still relevant. We will train you, we'll deploy you. But there is something that the individual also has to do. So how do you do it in cricket, right? There are people who are arrested um, uh, because the younger crop comes in. There's a big, you know, bench of people who are great. Uh, what is the role of a player in that case? And what's the role of a, a Cricket Australia equivalent in that case? Well, look, I think it um, it all depends on who the player is. And look, I, I think everyone goes through it at their in their career. So for me personally, it was about 2010. Uh, I just finished up playing Test Cricket. I was still playing One Day Cricket for Australia and T20 Cricket. And, and they were, I was told from Cricket Australia that I was getting a bit too old. Now, that's just what normally happens in, in sport. You know, we've got some young, some young crop coming through, some, some young uh, fast bowlers coming through. We want to look to the future. We look to the next World Cup. We obviously still want you to be involved. So then what, what could I do to stay relevant? How do I then compete with this, this, this young crop that might be half my age? So what you have to do is, is, is bring a different skill set. You have to bring different tools to the table. And what different tools are might be to work on my slow ball bouncer, to work on my death bowling. One thing I worked really hard on was, was my Yorker. And I wanted, it, it didn't matter how old I was, one thing I thought that I could back myself in over any other bowler in Australia was was bowling at the death, so it was bowling the Yorker. So that was one of my strengths, and I, I would make sure that I'd practice my strength because what people do sometimes is that they might have a strength there and then they might have a weakness there. And what they do, their weakness is always lower, so the weakness is there, and they'll try to work on their weakness to get it up to about there. And then their strength they haven't worked on and it would come down to about there. So then they become stuck, they almost become a worse player because they haven't worked on what they're good at. Whereas I was like making sure that my strength was up there and try to bring my weakness up a little bit. But if there were things that I knew I couldn't do well, you might have to scrap that. If I wasn't great at bowling the in swing with a new ball, which I wasn't, I wouldn't do that. So I'll make sure I'd still work very hard on my strength. And my strength is bowling at the death. So it didn't matter how old I was, I wanted to make sure that I was the person that, that they could turn to and rely on when they needed a Yorker to try and get a wicket. So the other thing too is that embrace the youth coming through. Don't shy away from it. Don't try to compete with it. Embrace that enthusiasm that makes you younger too, you know. Get them in. Ask them questions. Don't be stubborn or pig-headed to think, well, I've played more tests than this bowler coming through. He hasn't played a test yet. But you know what? He might have a particular ball that he could teach me. And then I was saying you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's, it's wrong. You can learn. And I've learned so many different ways to bowl from younger guys in the squad that they've taught me, and I've passed on knowledge to them. But you have to be able to leave the ego aside and learn from them too. Interesting, great. Just one other thing, right? Uh, as you mature and as you, there's about this thing about learning from uh, failures and learning from times when you are kept aside and said you need to be rested, right? You started this early, right? In the early stages of your career, you had significant stress fractures in your back, right? Um, at least a couple of times when you were rested because of that. You went on to break an el elbow as well, I think. And, and you know, every time that would happen, Oh, it's still there. Every time that will happen, you get rested, right? What goes through your mind when that happens, when you're taken away for three months, six months, and you have to you know, mentally manage that besides physically manage the challenge that you have? What goes through your mind and how do you come out of it? Well, what, what goes through your mind firstly is, is 
this is it's very painful because if you've done like another injury you know that there's the pain initially of the injury then there's the pain of not being able to play for your country the pain of being out of the team for three months six months sometimes nine months i mean my my elbow injury put me out of the team for close to 12 months and that's a long time on the sideline when my dream was to to play for australia and to play for australia for a long period of time and now i'm feeling good but i can't because i've got this horrible you know scar on my elbow there from from surgery that i had and my arm was never going to be the same and unfortunately for me this this arm here which which i can't straighten you can see where it's it's been you know i've had surgery through there i've had surgery on on this side there which i've got a lump i've got two titanium uh, pins in my elbow and i've never been able to straighten my elbow but what goes through your mind is how do i become that person to, to be able to bowl fast again how do i overcome this injury how do i overcome the pain how do i overcome the thought what if it happens again and that's where that whole mental training so i like to say that when you burst into the national side whether it's india or australia i would say that you are 80 percent ability and 20 percent mental strength when you're in there for a year or so i believe then it becomes flipped over it becomes 80 percent that mental strength and 20 percent ability because if you've got there you've reached the team you've obviously got that natural ability now you have to work on the natural ability but how do you keep performing well and trusting your body and overcoming adversity and overcoming injuries and the press are you know are on you that's when that mental strength kicks in so i i had a you know a few little things that i would work on so i had six ankle op, you know operations i think five ankle operations on my left ankle and every time i went to surgery i knew what was going to happen i knew there'd be three or four months out of the game i'd have to work on my rehab and and look and it was that, that 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 was a very stressful, painful exercise because you know watching the guys do well and thinking, am I ever going to get my spot back ever again? But I had to trust my body. I had to trust the physiotherapists. I had to trust the doctors that they were doing the right thing. And then when I got back training, and it's different from going from training sessions to your first game back. Now, pitcher, I'm playing against India, which I did one of my return games. And I know that the first ball still gonna hurt the back of my ankle. So what do I tell myself? That mental strength. I trust my ability. I trust that I could still bowl the way I wanted to bowl. But it's all those negative thoughts that go through your mind. So I trick my brain. I teach my brain that a few a few days ago I played a game against India and I took Pfeiffer and I'd visualise wickets that I took against India last game that I played against them. And I would imprint that into my mind. So when I went out to the game, I'm thinking, I took five for last week. I'm on top. I'm going to go in and dominate against India. This is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. It's going to happen because I do this, 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 this. If that doesn't work, I'll do this, 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 this. Not like, oh, this is going to hurt. This is going to kill. My ankle's going to be sore. Will I get through the game? What if I don't get any wickets? The press going to say it's too old. So can you see that... The, the two sides and it's so easy to go down that other road of what if it's going to hurt what does everyone else think you've got to clear that out it's the same with business you've got to back your own ability but you can only back your own ability when you've done the hard work if you haven't done the hard work and you try to cheat yourself and try to lie to yourself it won't happen Interesting, Brett. Uh, one last question on this front, and we'll take a few more of the audience questions. Uh, retiring, right? And it's not an easy task to do, right? And in 2015, you called it quits, right? When do you know you've done your bit, right? Uh, that there's a need to handle the the bait into somebody else in the next generation. How did you decide to retire from cricket? You were not old 
by corporate standards by any day, right? How did you decide to uh, to retire, and and what did what went through your mind? Well, I mean that that that's probably like another tough question because there's no right or wrong answer with when it's right, but it, it's such a personal thing. So for me, I wanted to retire when I knew I could still do what I wanted to do, and. For me, it was bowling 150 Ks. Now, I could have played cricket. I'm 44 years of age now, and I could still play cricket with the right training. I, I, I believe I could still bowl over 140 Ks now. Now, it's probably going to hurt more. There'll be a lot more um, rehab. There'll be a lot more pre-season work that goes into it. But I still believe I could still hit 140 Ks with the right training because I know how to do it. But at the end of the day, I didn't want to do that. I was content. I was happy with what I achieved. And the other thing too, that if I can go out on top knowing that I could still bowl 150 Ks at the age of 38, 39, that I could still take wickets, that I could still compete with some of the best players and even compete with guys half my age, go out on top at the right time, that I, that I think is when you, you know, you've made the right call. Now, most importantly, at 38, 39 years of age, and I believe I've achieved everything that I want to achieve and I was playing for the Sydney Sixers. I look over at some young kid who's 17, 18 years of age, sitting on the bench, wanting to get his opportunity, and I'm taking his spot. He might have an opportunity if I wasn't playing. I've been content with what I've done. I'm happy. It's at the right time. I've made the call. That's when you've got to pass the baton over and go, righto, youngster, over to you now. Because we've seen so many people hang on. What, what, what are they hanging on for? Are they hanging on for money? Are they hanging on for the fame? Are they hanging on for the accolades? I wasn't about that. I was hanging on for, well, I wasn't hanging on. I was playing because I loved the game. And I only wanted to play when I believed I could, I could give something back to the game. And you know, that old cliche, you try to leave the game in a better position than when you found it. But as an entertainer, I believe that I was still good enough to play at that level. And then when I made my mind up at the right time, even though I could have played the following year, I went, no, nah, I'm done. I'm happy. I'm content. I can walk away. And the best the best uh, piece of feedback that you can get from anyone, whether it's a commentator, someone in the press, or someone down the street, when they tell you you retired too young, that's when you know you've made the right call. Amazing, Brett. I think just amazing to hear that. Uh, it takes a lot of guts to do that, right? Uh, when you're still reasonably top of your form uh, when you do this, right? We'll take a few more of the audience questions. Uh, there's one which says, uh, why is that we don't see many fast bowlers becoming captains uh, of teams? Any thoughts on that? Look, there, there's, there's, there's been some wonderful um, fast bowlers who have been captains. It's not the norm, though, it's it's not in vogue. And I think the reason why, it, it's because it's such a hard strain being a fast bowler than to think about. So if, I, if I'm now trying to focus on what I'm doing, and cricket's a very funny game. So cricket is a game like business, which I'll get to in a second, but cricket is a game of 11 individuals playing in a team environment. Now, the 11 individuals have to do stuff individually the best they can to help their team. So I need to take wickets to help my team. Uh, Adam Gilchrist needs to score runs and catch balls behind the stumps to, to help his team. Uh, Ricky Pron needs to score runs to help the Australian cricket team. But what generally happens is because you, you, you know, you're so focused on taking wickets as a fast bowler and such a tiring thing too, um, the the hardest thing then to think about that, that mental strength when you're exhausted after bowling five overs straight or six overs, or you may have bowled what we saw with Pat Cummins and Hazelwood and those types of guys bowling 26 overs in that last day. It, it'd be so hard to focus on what they're doing and so hard to focus on what the rest of the team needs. So that's where I think normally the captain, the captain is a batsman, um, or a batsman keeper that have got the best view of the game where they stand their slips. They're not exerting a lot of energy so they can actually focus on what they're doing and focus on the rest of the team. It can happen. We had 
you know, some great captains in in, in Jeff Lawson for, for New South Wales and Australia. Um, you know, we've seen some, you know, I think Pat Cummins could potentially make a great captain for Australia. But it's 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 a hard job. It'd be a hard job to be a captain and be a hard job to be a captain and, and also a fast bowler. Now that you bring Pat Cummins' name, any 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 comments on the compare between a Pat Cummins and a Bumrah? What do you think? Well, two two different bowlers, two very effective bowlers that do things extremely well. Pat Cummins is world class, as is Bumrah. Bumrah is the the guy that he's so good. He, I mean, he just like stutters in this goes bang, and he's got such a fast arm action. He's got impeccable line length. And he bowls well with the new ball and bowls well with well, well with the old ball. So that that to me is world class. Pat Cummins swings the ball both ways, both new ball and old ball, a bit like Bumra. Different action, a bit more of a, of a traditional action we're seeing with Pat Cummins as opposed to Bumra. But two very very effective bowlers, and they and they will go down as as some of the greatest fast bowlers to play Test cricket. I can promise you that because they are world class. Thanks. There's one question that's being repeatedly asked, and I don't know why, so I need to understand this. Maybe I didn't research you well enough. Have you ridden horses, and what's your view on horsemanship? Have I ridden horses? Not not really. Um, I've rid ridden a couple horses in my life, but, uh, look, I love I love the farming life. I've got a farm uh, down on, on in, in the southern highlands of uh, of New South Wales, but it's more more farming, you know, it's more more cattle and... Um, you know, just like heaps of grasslands, that type of thing. But uh, yeah, ho horses for me, they're they're pretty scary to get on. So yeah, I'm I'm not really into. I mean, I've I've done it, I enjoy it, but I wouldn't do it for a hobby. Thanks, Brett. I think absolutely amazing speaking uh, to you. I know there are some more uh, questions. Somebody's still pushing and saying, "Who do you think will win the four, fourth test, India or Australia?" And you've been pretty diplomatic about it. Any toss-ups, or you want to just say one last answer for that? I think it's going to be very, very tight. I think it's going to be extremely tight. I, I believe that um, if India can find the attack that can, can swing the ball and bowl the right length of the gather, then there's definitely a chance to knock over Australia's top order. Likewise, that if you know the Aussie bowlers get it right, they can make some quick inroads because what we know about the gather is that it's a great place to bowl days one, almost day two, days two and a half, three and four are great to bat on, and then spin comes into play. So, you know, the Gabbers are a very, very great wicket to bowl on uh, and also to play cricket. It's normally the first test of the summer that's at the Gabba. So we always have the first test because the ball swings around and and players that aren't used to the ball shaping around and bouncing and carrying through the keeper generally haven't got the, that uh, technique to get through it. But now that India's come right through the season, they come right through the Australian summer, they've got used to Australian wickets, I think they'll be a lot better suited now than what they would have been when they first start. So it will be very, very tight. Um, probably too tight a to call. I'll never not back Australia. I think Australia got a very good chance. But I also believe that India got a good chance too. So if you win the toss, you bowl first, right? That's what you think will happen. Well, look, I, I think it's a toss where you'd always win and bat first unless it's an absolute green top. But if you lost a toss and you had a bowl first, sometimes it's not a bad toss to lose because you want to get first use of the wicket. You know, you get if you if you bowl well at the Gabba, you'll take early wickets. But even when the ball's swinging around, if you if you don't bowl well and you bowl the wrong length, you bowl too short. That's where batsmen can hammer you at the Gabba. Brett, thank you. Absolutely amazing speaking to you. We're at the top of the hour, and I need to bring in my friend Bimal. Um, to close the close the session, Bimal, all yours. Hi, hi, Brett. Hi. Hi, Bimal. How are you? Doing very well, Brett. Uh, you know, I amongst many other reasons, the last question is also a reason why we. I, I wish this this session was happening in the physical format, and we could have asked this question to everyone, right, including audience. India jitega, Australia jitega. India India jitega, Australia jitega. Who knows? India jitega. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure that. here we would have outnumbered you, Brett. Here, here we would have outnumbered. But amazing performance. I, I, I'm sure uh, 
again you you bold audience i mean clean bold them all all of them uh, and anuj you spoke so gloriously about uh, brex debut match uh, i i can only tell you we i mean on a lighter note brett we hated every moment of that test match right you took five wickets in your first bowling this thing right it was a boxing day match punch wicket yeah punch wicket liya aapne yeah yeah it was a boxing day match i was still in my in my graduation uh, and it was it was just i mean we hated you then to be to be honest right and uh, uh, you know in fact in fact i i i can say that that uh, you know three words uh, brett was feared hated and loved at the same time right he was obviously uh, feared by the batsmen who were facing him he was hated by the opposition side and i can i can tell you a lot of uh, girls who were with me in my graduation college back then used to love you uh, a lot so so feared hated and loved you at the same time but but thank you very much brett i i think this was this was wonderful uh, this also was the last session of our two days of confluence and 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 like i said we couldn't have got a better person to speak on accelerating your performance performing on day 1 uh, five wickets in your very first test debut is is just is just an example of that thank you very much i know it's very late for you uh, uh, thanks okay. a lot brett and anuj really really thankful you made the session even more engaging uh, thanks a lot thanks guys yes, thank you thank you bimol thank you anuj you you're fantastic my great to chat to you both again and uh yeah hopefully the audience enjoyed it but look at the end of the day i think in 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 my closing point it's 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 being true to you as a person you have to be true to yourself if you can look yourself in the mirror and go today i've done my best job there's there's a great saying that my friend my mentor always tells me is that you'll never be as bad as what you were today you know in other words you you know tomorrow will be a bright sunny day you know you'll get through the day we've had a, a horrible 12 months with covid let's look at the positive side of life rather than the negatives um and 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 just enjoy what we have you know enjoy each other's company but you've got to work hard and strive strive for the best challenge yourself and keep trying new things super super thanks a lot thank brad thanks have a have a good night yeah thank, thank you. you thank you thanks thanks anuj thanks a lot thanks for doing this for us